Gobi, let's start off with you. Tactical versus strategic asset allocation. I think that it warrants a definition. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, let me start off by saying that I've worked for two teams. I've worked yeah. in, for one team that has only believed in strategic asset allocation and no tactical bends away from the strategic allocation. And I've worked for teams where there's been tactical asset allocation. Just by ways of definition, strategic asset allocation means that there's a certain amount of assets that you need to hold or percentage in certain assets that yeah. you need to hold over time in order to achieve a specific investment objective. And the tactical bend to that or the tactical allocation is by how much you vary away from strategic asset allocation in order to favor one asset class over another. So let's assume a portfolio of assets need to hold about 50% in assets from a strategic perspective. If you favor equities, you would go and hold 55% or even 60% depending on the risk that you want to associate with your specific investment product. And then it's because you're favoring equity is relative to some of the other asset classes. I see, but I mean, is it a buy and hold strategy or is well, there you, rebalancing? You might you be changing this to. over time. And that yeah. all depends now about, you know, on the team, the bottom up view that they might have, the economic view that they might have. And also just, you know, it all very much just depends on, on what, they, what they're trying to achieve and over what time periods. So you might decide to become tactical and go away from your strategic asset allocation for a very short period of time, but it might be for a prolonged period of time. That all depends. And, and of course, and that depends really on what's happening in the macro economy. Something like a crisis would obviously make you rebalance and relook at things. Andrew, let's get your definition on strategic versus tactical. Yeah, I, I think uh, as Kirby said, I mean, strategic is typically associated with that combination which people believe that if they hold it for the long term, it will meet their return objective. And, and uh, as Kirby said, tactical is taking deviations around that. Mm -hmm. um, I think tactical, though, is also typically associated with being relative to the strategic asset um, allocation that has been set. Um, at Sun and Multi Manager, our differentiation is, is, is that our active asset allocation which is similar to, to strategic, is not conducted necessarily relative to that strategic asset allocation because we sometimes think that being tactical can still be constraining. Okay, I suppose it really comes down to returns at the end of the day. Let's delve into a little bit of historical data when it comes to tactical and strategic asset allocation. Which uh, strategy, if I could say that, uh, which scenario has played out to the benefit of investors in the long term? Yeah. Um, there's been a number of studies done on this, um, two really famous ones. Uh, the one focused on how much the variation in the returns that you achieved mm -hmm. is as a result of your asset allocation. Um, and then a second study was done, what percentage of your total return could be attributed to your strategic asset allocation. And, and both of the answers that came out of those studies were incredibly high percentages. In the first, it was in excess of 90%. And in the second study, it actually said in excess of 100% of your total return, you could ascribe to asset allocation. And in fact, active management actually destroyed value over time. And it was on the basis of those studies that many, many people believed that one should just implement a strategic asset allocation and mechanistically rebalance to that. Yeah. Um, our view, though, is, is, is that one of the uh, points that was missed is that at no time was it questioned whether that actual asset allocation was the most efficient at any one point in time. And that's where we have some concerns about following a strategic asset allocation approach. Roland, doesn't that come down to the benchmark? At the end of the day? Um, absolutely. I think the, the, the benchmark is going to be um, typically in these kind of funds a target return in, in, in the sense of an inflation plus something kind of um, expected return. Um, it is tough to, I mean, that, that is what the end investor would like to achieve over the long run. But uh, there's a difference between a benchmark and a target return. A target return is a, a required rate that you need to yeah. retire more wealthy or at least at the same wealth that you are currently. Whereas a benchmark, that is used to measure skill of the manager is a different concept. And if we wanted to identify managers with skill, we would have to have a multi-factor kind of approach to identifying which managers add value or not. Um, and, and CPI plus five or whatever it is, is fine as a, as a requirement, but uh, you can't actually it's not an investable benchmark, and that's why a lot of people say you can't use it to measure skill. Well, as Andrew alluded to, those uh, studies that were done, and it seems that, yes, when you look at your targets in terms of asset allocation, uh, perhaps not the most efficient over time, how can you ensure that you are the most efficient at any given certain period of time? Does it come down to rebalancing? Well, I think what we've been missing so far in this debate is that there are two aspects to investing. There is return and risk. And the, the 
return argument is very clear. We want to have a strategic sort of, we don't want to churn the fund too much, so we want to have a strategic kind of long-term uh, view of, of where we're going to harvest these, these excess returns from. But I think uh, tactical is often used to try and uh, adjust to um, changing market conditions in terms of managing the risk. I remember a case in, in Europe where a fund manager during the credit crisis did not rebalance their portfolio. And the pension fund phoned the fund manager and said, you know, we've lost 40% of our worth. Uh, our pension fund has shrunk by 40% in a year. Uh, what are you doing about it? And the, the fund manager said, we are long-term investors, you know, stick with us. And the pensioner was very upset with that because you need to have some kind of risk management in the short term. And that's where the tactical kind of uh, you see, adjustments this, come I in. I mean, and this is exactly what, what Roland is mentioning here now, is that is for that reason why when people are only strategic, that means they hold on to a certain asset allocation through time regardless. You know, it kind of, it leaves an investment team without a tool in their toolbox, so to speak. Because I kind of, you can see an equity market becoming more and more and more expensive or a bond market for that matter or any market for that matter. And you want to try and sell down in a market like that. You want to try and get rid of some of your holding, but now you can't because you're only strategic. But there's a second point in this whole argument as well, and I think this is a point that, uh, that, that Andrew was alluding to just now. And that is, if you're going to have a strategic asset allocation, and you're going to have tactical bands around this asset allocation, and look, you've got the skill now to be tactical as well, um, what, what measure is there, what measures are there uh, to say that the strategic asset allocation is actually correct? You know, a decade ago, we said, well, a balanced product should have the following allocation. So much in equity, so much in bonds, and so much in yeah. property, and so much international. And if you breach and those, you become overweight or underweight uh, within that correct. specific yes. asset. Correct, yes. And in a moderate product, this should be the allocation. Well, well, who says that's right or wrong? As a matter of fact, I mean, I've back-tested some of these yeah. numbers. And quite frankly, there's certain market conditions which favor those allocations, and there's certain ones that don't. So now the question is, how right is strategic asset allocation? As a matter of fact, you get to a point where if you just do this on, you know, just from a statistical perspective, you start saying, well, how significant are these data so, points? So what metrics are being used when it comes to that, measuring where we can be most efficient at any given point in time with asset allocation? Who has come up with these numbers? Well, I, th I, think, where the in <coughs> excuse me, I think where the industry is going is, is that there's the realisation, as, as Kirby says, is, is that these strategic asset allocations that are being based on these long-term averages, very seldom over a shorter period of time do you actually experience that average. And here we're not just talking about the return side of the equation, we're also talking about the volatility, which people mm -hmm. typically associate with risk, but also the correlation effect, which is the way in which the underlying asset classes move relative to one another. Um, there is compelling evidence to suggest that volatility is not constant that correlation, that movement is not constant. So just by virtue of that fact, there are going to be points in time where that strategic asset allocation that you derived based on these long-term averages, it cannot be efficient. Mm. It cannot be the most return that you can get for your clients at any given level of risk. There will always be an asset allocation that will be superior to it. And, and that's essentially our point. And, and then, as coming back to what I said earlier, is that if you are taking tactical asset allocation bets specifically around that, and you have very hard-coded limits around that, those limits themselves can also act as impediments. So yes, you can do better, so you can mm -hmm. reduce your equity exposure when you think equities are expensive. But if the client has said to you, my benchmark in equities is 50, but you're not allowed to go less than 40, as a fund manager, you may feel we're sitting here middle of 2007 or 2008, I really should have 30% of my portfolio, um, uh, rather of, of my portfolio invested in equities, but this tactical asset allocation range says I have to hold a minimum of 40. And so that's why, you know, we're suggesting that one should be active around your asset allocation, absolutely but not in the traditional sense of tactical, which is relative to strategic. Sorry, that does, it is a bit of a mouthful, that. No, I mean, it perfectly exactly, I mean, I exactly what Andrew is saying there is, is, is critically important in the whole strategic versus tactical uh, debate. Remember that also that, you know, having, uh, having a strategic asset allocation and being tactical around it is somehow used usually as a measure to keep an investment team kind of true to their word. So it's used as a governance structure. So you as a client always know that, look, 
if they're going to be bullish on equities, then they're going to own not 50, they're going to own 60. And if they're bearish, they're not going to own 50, they're going to own 40. But now who says that's right or wrong? Mm. So now usually what happens in asset management businesses is that the, the board of directors usually sit down or the managers sit down and say, well, at least now we know how they're going to behave. At least we've got bands. But that's not necessarily giving the, uh, the, the investment managers the ability in order to move the way that they should be moving relative to markets. Relative so you need to, to have the markets. best of both worlds, essentially. Roland, let's get you into this as well. Uh, tell us about some of the decision making that needs to come to the fore when it comes to tactical versus strategic and implementing both scenarios uh, depending on what is playing out on a global level. It depends largely on the mandates. For example, if a fund of funds will issue a mandate, and uh, as Andrea is saying, the more flexible you can make the mandate, the more opportunity you can uh, get these managers to, to add value rather than constraining them too much. But, uh, Are investors averse to getting into these flexible, flexible type funds? I think we all have to get into those kind of funds in the long run because those are the drivers of, of, of returns. portfolio returns. Yeah. E equity, bonds, cash, international, that's where your returns are going to come from. What you do within those asset classes, you can debate how much value that is adding. Um, I, I've done some studies that shows that um, if you have a very large fund size, in other words, if you're managing more than 10 to 20 billion rand, mm. you're actually forced to become an asset allocator because stock picking has a, what we call a carrying capacity. There's only so much money you can use to get in and out of stocks before you're too big and then you're going to be either moving the market against yourself or you're going to be unable to get in and out quickly enough to make use of whatever skill you have. So you sort of forced the larger you are to become uh, an asset allocator. Whether you're strategic or tactical is a, is a secondary debate. But uh, stock picking definitely has an upper limit uh, in terms of fund size, mm. whereas asset allocation I know, Kobe, that you're very much a skills man. And something that Andrew alluded to earlier, mm. that some of the view that um, active management destroys value mm. over time. Mm. What is your response to this? And obviously, skills very much tied to the scenario because you have to get the timing right you've got to get have, have to have the asset allocation right um, there's a lot of elements that play into this and then obviously the fee structure also is quite important there are simplistically three sources of returns for any for any fund if you're going to be active the first is obviously what the market what the benchmark is going to get actually Rhodes is, is a skills man what? I correct myself. What, what are you trying to say here you're saying yes, that I know your skills. Sense, yeah yeah so I mean there's there's three elements that you've got to return the first yeah. is the benchmark what is the what is it that the benchmark is going to give you then you've got the tactical bend either for or against against the benchmark and here I'm talking about a single index type benchmark like you know in, the, in a share based index relative to its bonds and cash uh, uh, um, uh, counterparties and then the third element is obviously from an from an active management perspective how much value can active managers uh, actually add to it if you're going to be passive as far as your asset management is concerned then all of a sudden as Roland quite rightly pointed out, asset allocation means everything for returns. You've got to get that right. Get that wrong and you're going to destroy returns. If you're going to be active, well, now it all depends on how good you are with manager selection and how well you can, how you, how well you can, you, can you generate returns over and above a benchmark because it gives you another tool in the toolbox in order to try and generate returns beyond mm -hmm. a composite benchmark of assets. From your experience, Andrew, what kind of asset allocation uh, dynamics has worked better? I mean, and let's perhaps juxtapose uh, emerging markets relative to developed markets. Sure, that's an incredibly difficult question because we sit here today with the benefit of hindsight yeah. uh, and it obviously clouds our, our, our view. I think Roland alluded to it earlier on is that, is that the industry is definitely moving towards more unconstrained mandates where if you are able to identify those really skillful managers, don't constrain them, don't put the handcuffs on them, allow them to invest where they honestly believe true value resides and let them try and maximize the returns uh, for your clients and it's moving I think less, um, well, moving away from this well-confined, strategic, um, tactical asset allocation environment. Isn't the solution to this perhaps not only looking to one fund, but having diversification across various funds, which obviously gives you um, sort of a different risk profile depending on which fund you're exposed to? Um, certainly it's, it's part of the solution and, yeah. and, and it's the solution which we try to bring to our clients and, and, and which many people do in a multiple manager type of portfolio. Um, regardless of, of, uh, of how a portfolio is constructed, uh, portfolio managers have a way in which they view the world uh, and that also has an implication on the type of return that they can uh, deliver for you. Uh, as a result of their investment philosophy. And that's where somebody who's putting together portfolios of multiple managers yeah. is able to potentially add some value. Roland, let's, um, in fear of sounding perhaps too theoretical today, let's take it down to what's happening in the scenario uh, globally. 
We've well, got, I mean, equities perhaps looking overheated on the emerging market front. Do you start shifting towards being slightly underweight equities and slightly more overweight cash? Tell us about asset allocation in today's scenario. I think the big fear globally is the whole inflation uh, debate. In other words, a lot of people are worried um, about uh, a rising inflation, which means interest rates should go up. And the problem for any asset allocator is where are your returns going to come from? And I'm quite worried that over the next five years, absolute return managers might not be able to as easily offer an absolute return as they have in the past because what are their tools? Cash, bonds, equity, offshore. Now, if interest rates go up, uh, um, equity and bonds don't do that well in those kind of in environments. So the two most important drivers that are giving you these long-term returns in the short term or in the next five years might not give you any returns. So your CPI plus five mandate becomes a lot harder to beat. Absolutely, and you've got to be proactive as opposed to reactive mm. as well. Uh, Kobe, when it comes to rebalancing our portfolio, something that I ask a lot of investors on the desk, and it seems that on a quarterly basis seems to be very popular. Some say on a bi-yearly basis, others say looking, re-looking at uh, the re-weighting on a, a yearly basis. What is your view? Look, rebalancing is quite a, it's quite a, it's quite an intense question you're actually answering, be asking, because it's not just a fact of, you know, kind of, you know, getting rid of the excess holding that you've got in a certain asset class in order to bring it back. It's a mathematical argument relative to a cost argument as well. So guys say it on a quarterly basis because they're trying to mitigate the cost as far as the stuff is concerned. But really what you should be doing is you should be looking at asset allocation on a daily, weekly basis, monthly basis. And again, look at market movements. If we've got a flat market for a whole month well don't bother looking at it you know yeah. but if you've got a really strong upward or downward moving market you should be doing rebalancing much more often uh, much more often than that and again you know just from that perspective and again if you're rebalancing we're again by default saying that there's a strategic way of actually managing money um, which is now again you know there's a whole bunch of thought out there saying that maybe we shouldn't be strategic because then what yeah. are you gonna be rebalancing okay. so Andrew yeah. I'm giving the last word on tactical versus strategic very quickly mm -hmm. last thoughts I think uh, looking forward, I think we think the markets are going to be a lot more volatile. One is need to going to be more active in your portfolios. Having a long-term strategic asset allocation that you stick to may well end up with you getting into trouble.